everyone. This is Dr. Laurel Cook, Associate Professor of Marketing at West Virginia University. This lecture today is a combination of chapters 8, which is about perception, and 9, which is about learning, memory, and product positioning. Again, this lecture is customized based on class responses to the Connect assignments. Some material in this lecture is not included in your text. Let's get started. As we begin with Chapter 8 in Perception, I think it would be helpful to understand just how beneficial this topic is for marketers. To help you understand this at a global level, let's show a brand illustration. Here we have a beauty brand that released a line of lipstick products with the, the names you see on the screen. Hopefully, you can spot the big giant error. Of course, this particular error had a lot of negative and unfavorable consumer responses. By looking at the screen and looking at a real brand response, what do you think the social media marketer was actually thinking? Why do you think in this case they failed? And not just a little bit, but they failed massively. Most marketers today would agree that this particular response or way of responding is wholly inappropriate. If you, as a marketing student, were to answer, well, I didn't know my customer, or I was in a bad mood, maybe that's why the social media marketer in this case responded in this inappropriate way, then that would be described as an internal locus of control. So this locus of control can be either internal or external. It's kind of how we, as consumers and people, assign blame. If you as a marketing student were to say, well, I think the social media marketer in this case thought their customers were just jerks, or maybe the manager didn't train that person very well. In that case, it's the external locus of control. So the blame in this case is not with a social media marketer, but outside of their control, some external influence. Your textbook says, perception consists of those activities by which a person acquires and assigns meaning to some stimuli. It sounds very official and scientific, but really what you as a student needs to understand is that you as the brand you as the entrepreneur, as the inventor, you can have the world's best product ever, like the product you see on the screen here. Who wouldn't love a KFC and Krispy Kreme donut mashup, right? Maybe it's the best product ever. But you can still have poor consumer response. For example, you can have low sales. And this result can be predicted by marketers if there's an understanding about consumer perceptions. If sales are low, it's likely consumer perceptions about the product are unfavorable. What I'd like you to understand is that perceptions in this in all cases is really a meaning or a value a person gives to something like a brand's product or service. It's also important for you to understand that perception isn't just a presence or absence. It occurs in three different stages. All the consumer behavior research to date has helped us understand these stages. First you have exposure, next you have attention, and then you have interpretation. If and when perception happens, the meaning derived from some sort of stimulus, maybe it's a product, maybe it's an ad, maybe it's a new price for a product, it's typically transferred to memory. And that memory is stored and can be later retrieved by consumers when they're making purchase decisions. So my question to you is, what type of exposure, if we look at the first stage of perception, applies specifically or even mostly to ads? If you answered deliberate exposure, you would be right. So next we need to ask ourselves. How does perception affect persuasion? Marketers have to determine how consumers acquire information and how much they are able to use that information effectively and if they want their messages, in this case, to persuade consumers. That's our job as marketers. So here we're returning to a linchpin concept 
I've mentioned several times before, it's involvement. If you take anything away from this consumer behavior semester, I hope you remember how important involvement really is, especially in predicting consumer behavior. Can we always know what a consumer is going to do? No. But now we have enough science to understand the big players in this picture. Involvement is a very big player. And all of this comes from the science of understanding how information is processed. So again, let's take this construct of involvement. And let's say I'm in front of you today, and I say, I'm excited to discuss perception with you. Of course, the range of involvement between students is going to differ between low, maybe to no involvement, to very high. So for those students who say, oh my goodness, I really love psychology, or I find this topic so interesting, or I'm glad I sat in the front row. Obviously, these are good examples of people that would probably fall in the high involvement group. If I give a really good and strong argument about this topic we're discussing, and I describe it well, and I'm clearly understood for these high involvement students, they might respond by saying, wow, I've never thought of that before. I completely agree. Excellent points. So I persuaded them. These people in this condition, these people are persuaded through the central root of information processing. So I could be, in other words, wearing pajamas and have messy hair and have dorky looking glasses on. But if the quality of my argument is strong, then I can convince these people and persuade these people to agree with me. So for these people with high involvement, persuasion in this case occurs if the argument is compelling and the result is a marketer's dream. Any change in attitude in this case, because I persuaded them, is long lasting. It's resistant to change and I can more accurately predict their future behavior. Now let's take the alternative group of people in the room. Students who might be saying, it's hot and stuffy in here, I'm tired, I shouldn't have gone to that party, or I have to use the restroom. These are people that might easily be categorized as low involvement. So no matter what I say, the only way I can convince these people to be persuaded it are by peripheral cues. Peripheral means it's not the content of what I'm saying, it's how I appear. So it's if I'm wearing professional attire, or if I'm speaking enthusiastically, or if I appear really nice and friendly. All these external cues, what we call peripheral cues, these are the cues that are useful in helping low involvement people be persuaded. For people with low involvement, persuasion occurs if these cues are compelling. The result is a change in persuasion. But marketers need to understand that this kind of attitude change is very temporary and very susceptible to further change. Now, let's talk about how information processing and perception relate to our brain. So here we're looking at a brain. And I love talking about the brain. I've had training in neuroscience and marketing, and I'm delighted to share this experience and training with you today to help you understand the key part of the human brain that helps us as marketers understand how information is processed and how perception is affected. And that special part of our brain is right above the forehead, right in the very front part of our brain. It's called the prefrontal cortex. It's the anatomy of the human brain, that prefrontal cortex, that distinguishes our species from any other species. It's why we're able to figure out what two plus, plus two is. It's why we're able to create a pros and cons list and make complicated choices. That part of our brain is where we figured out where so much of the information we make as humans takes place. But what might be interesting for you to understand is out of all the information that's processed in the brain, the prefrontal cortex is t accounts for maybe 10 to 20% of that. So very, very low. Now that number isn't very precise because we're still learning so much about the brain today, even in this year. 
But we do know the vast majority of information that goes through our brain is actually processed by the subconscious. And this is where distraction of feeling occurs. So here's another way of looking at it. We have the conscious mind, that prefrontal cortex, that accounts for 10 to 20%, if I'm being generous. But what's exciting for us as marketers to realize is that the subconscious mind takes about 80 to 90% of the information in our memory. So, so many consumer-related decisions are made, not consciously per se, but as a function of the subconscious. The conscious mind helps us to analyze, think and plan, and is associated with short-term memory. The subconscious mind, however, is associated with long-term memory, emotions and feelings, habits, addictions, impulses, creativity, and intuition. So, let's talk about the stages of perception again in more detail. We'll begin again with stage one, and that's exposure. What I'm hopeful that you as marketing students will understand, again, is the big dichotomy between exposure being selective and voluntary. Next is stage two, attention. And attention is really determined by three different factors. And most students always think it's just about the stimulus. But really, attention is determined by three factors. So it's important for you to understand the other two parts of this equation. Stimulus factors are physical characteristics of the stimulus. And of course, that can be a product or, or service. The individual factors are characteristics which distinguish one individual from another. And situational factors include stimuli in the environment other than the focal stimulus and temporary characteristics of the person that are induced by, and here's the key word, the environment. So in other words, the situation you're in. Let me give you some examples for each of these. This is one of my favorite examples. Believe it or not, if you're on a dating site, you might want to consider adding a dog to your profile picture. So having the presence of a, a sweet little animal, a dog in this case, can help either a man or a woman appear more attractive. So do you see how this might really be helpful for attention? Now for the individual, again, these are characteristics which distinguish one person from another. That's why clickbait is still, even in this year, used because it has proven, again, time and time again to be effective. So all this clickbait you might see that's been personalized to you. You were just talking about Disney World, for example, if you're using the example shown on the screen. You're talking about it. Maybe you Googled something about Disney. And the next thing you're doing is you're opening up Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. And you see an ad very, very eerily related to the topic you were just researching. All of this, again, is customized to you because, again, it's been proven to capture your attention. You were just thinking about the brand. All of a sudden, you're seeing a special ad that's served up just for you. Now, you should know consumers to this day find this particular approach very, very creepy. In some cases, it backfires against the brand. But you can see how this would be a very effective form of attention getting if you can customize ads based to the person. Situational factors are those stimuli in the environment that might get someone's attention. And in this case, I like to use Jeep as one of my favorite examples. So perhaps you know that you're coming to Morgantown in your freshman year, you think, well, why would I ever care about buying a Jeep, for example, right? You're entering WVU as a freshman in August. The weather is great, and you're satisfied with the car you have. But maybe we have a particularly rough winter, and you realize that the car you have just won't cut it anymore. So the situation in this case has changed. And the situation now has your attention. And those Jeep ads all of a sudden are more compelling to you. Now, some things that your, your text doesn't go into great detail about 
is again on the second level of perception, all about attention. And it's the interesting phenomenon of hyper-focused attention. And I like to share this phenomenon called the cocktail party effect. So for example, no matter what your name is, maybe it's a common name, maybe it's a unique name. If you're in a room full of people, maybe a party, wherever you may be, and you hear someone say your name, your subconscious responds to that in a very specific way. You're able to attend to that person. You've, you can narrow down who just said your name because your brain responds to something it's very familiar with, its own name, right? Your own name. How are you able to do that in a room full of people? Well, it's called the cocktail party effect because your name is uniquely yours. And this particular example is, is again, one of hyper-focused attention. And it says it's our ability to be able to focus our auditory attention on a particular stimulus. In this case, it's someone saying our name. And we're able to do this simultaneously while filtering out a range of other stimuli, all the other people in the room talking. Much the same way that a party goer can focus on a single conversation in a noisy room. Next, of course, is the last stage, and that's interpretation. And this is probably where marketers spend the least amount of time. So again, interpretation, we have existing categories of meaning. So we're going to have interpretation based on those memories we can recall, or we might have an effective emotional reaction. And these, again, are emotions triggered by some sort of stimulus. Interpretation tends to be relative rather than absolute. So this is an important distinction for you. And interpretation tends to be subjective rather than objective. So it's not necessarily or rarely ever black and white. Misinterpretation, though, is something marketers should try to consider and plan for and avoid at all costs. So again, a humorous but somewhat lewd example is what you see on the screen now. And that's the logo created for a couple years ago or f four years ago, 2016, and it was the logo for the year of the monkey. <laughs> you hopefully don't need too much uh, explanation to help you understand why this particular logo was a terrible mistake. Here are some other examples of misinterpretation that are funny but helpful for you as a marketing student to understand just why this third and final stage of perception is so important. Here you have KFC's amazing logo and their tagline is finger licking good. But you should understand that this particular tagline does not translate well all over the world. So you might find it funny to understand that the Chinese Interpretation here is actually something very um, offensive, perhaps. In other words, the Chinese translation says, eat your fingers off. So it's definitely a tagline you would not want to use in that part of the world. Here we have another example from Coors Light with the tagline of turn it loose. Unfortunately, the, ch the Spanish translation here literally is to suffer from diarrhea. So terrible misinterpretation there. Another one comes from Schweppes, where their translation of tonic water in Italian actually turns into Schweppes toilet water. That's why you would never want to use the literal interpretation or translation of tonic water in, in Italian. Let's continue our discussion into Chapter 9 about learning, memory, and product positioning. Here, I find this particular figure from your textbook very helpful. It helps us understand how information is processed and what phase it's processed in, and the variety of learning outcomes associated with this. And it's important for you to understand the relationship between learning and memory and how that happens through information. And what you should see based on our earlier discussion today is this. All the stages of perception are playing a role in learning. Of course, learning is associated with our memory. 
Memory is both an outcome of learning and a part of the process of learning. It's extremely and incredibly interesting. But what I want to share with you right now is information that's brand new. It's not in your text yet. And it's all the fun ways that helps humans be weird and very fun to study. And that is all of the biases associated with the human mind. So in other words, even though we're human and we have this wonderful brain to help us make decisions, we are fallible. We make mistakes. We're not always operating and making decisions under perfect conditions and with perfect information. So what I need you as marketing students to understand and what I, extra tools I want to equip you with are the biases that differ as a function of what we should remember, what we as humans do when we have too much information, what we do and how we behave under conditions where we need to make a decision quickly, and lastly, how we make decisions and how we learn and use information when there's not enough meaning. So here, the bias is an emphasis on heuristics. I really want to help you understand what heuristics are. It's nothing more than a simple clue or a cue that we use. And our, as humans, we use these cues in our environment and based on the information we have at hand to help us make generalizations. I should note that the Google effect is also known by marketers as digital amnesia. In other words, this is the tendency specifically to forget information that can easily and readily be found online. According to the first study about the Google effect, people are less likely to remember certain details that they believe will be easily and readily accessible online. Next are the biases we as humans make when we have too much information. So one of my favorite examples is the Bider meinhof phenomenon, and that's this phenomenon related to selective attention. So like the meme on the screen shows, you learn a new word and suddenly you hear it everywhere. That's exactly what this phenomenon is all about. And we also have confirmation biases that support our existing beliefs. Let me give you an example from my own research. One thing that came across my research was an interesting bias. Again, this is associated when there's too much information. So now instead of picking up a nice juicy ribeye and making a judgment about that product based on the appearance of that product alone, now you have this nutrition facts panel, like the example you see on the screen, that's chock full of all this information about the product. And what we discovered is that there were, of course, biases. Many people had this bias against red meat, for example, and thought, well, if it's red meat and in the presence of this nutrition information, it must be bad for me. So it's kind of what we described a health horn. Alternatively, if it's a white meat product, you know, I'm kind of just associate what I think I know about white meat and have this bias that's a... a what we describe as a health halo. So by default, we're going to just assume that the product is good for us. And if you know anything about the actual nutrition profiles of red or white meat products, you would realize that there are actually some white meat products that are very unhealthy, full of fat. And there are some red meat products that are actually very healthy. Now, there are biases that come across as we learn and as we process information that occur when we have not enough meaning. So one of my favorite phenomenons under these conditions is known as the hot hand fallacy. This, is, this particular fallacy describes fallacious or wrong beliefs that a person who has experienced success with some sort of random event will have a greater chance of additional successes as they att make more attempts. The easiest way I know to explain this to you is to imagine that you're not a particularly talented baseball player or a basketball player, but you're playing basketball one day and all of a sudden you make a three-pointer and you do it again and you make it again. It's all net and you're doing very well. You have three in a row where you're making nothing but net. You're making the ball 
in the hoop. And you think you experience this hot hand fallacy. I've got something going. I don't know. I All of a sudden, I'm talented. And maybe I'm an up and coming. Maybe I'm a basketball superstar or prodigy. But this is just a fallacy. It's where we don't have enough meaning to ascribe to our three successes in a row. Another phenomenon is known as the spotlight effect. And this happens when people tend to think that they're noticed more than they really are. So here we have biases, where we as humans are making decisions or processing information, and we need to act fast. So in these cases, usually we favor simple looking options to avoid mistakes. We're motivated to preserve our autonomy and status in a group. We want to avoid irreversible decisions. We tend to stay focused, so we favor the immediate relatable thing that's right in front of us under these conditions. And to act, we must be confident we can make an impact and feel what we do is important. And marketers actually uncovered this idea known as the IKEA effect. So if you are familiar with IKEA, they're a great superstore where you can buy a lot of ready-to-be-built furniture. So imagine you have purchased a four-drawer chest, like you see on the screen, and you put this thing together yourself. Now, imagine what your estimation of the, that product's value is. Let's say you think it's worth, after it's assembled by you, $300. If you were to take the exact same product and have it professionally assembled by someone who's probably more adept at assembling products than you are, presumably, how much do you think you would value the product in that case? Well, the IKEA effect suggests that we, under, we have a bias under these conditions. We would associate the value higher, more highly, with the product we assembled ourselves. So again, the IKEA effect is when we as humans assign greater value on things we create than on things that objectively should be valued more highly. Another is known as Occam's razor. An Occam's razor is a, a tenant that will serve you well, not just in this class, but in life. When you have different hypotheses or different solutions or ideas, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. In other words, the simplest explanation is usually the best one. So this is a heuristic in this case that we might use as humans under conditions when we need to act fast. Another outcome from this chapter that I find especially useful for you as future marketers comes to us from our sister d discipline of psychology, specifically in this case, the American Psychological Association, who's helped us understand the seven sins of memory. Because of course, we as people are fallible. We make mistakes. We have biases. Our memory is not perfect. Now get memory. It's comprised of short-term memory. Again, those memories in the prefrontal cortex and long-term memory and can be a function of either classical conditioning or operant conditioning. And we'll cover each in more specific detail. So there are two forms of conditioned learning, either classical or operant. Sometimes they act in concert together. Classical conditioning attempts to create an association between some sort of stimulus, maybe it's a brand, and some response. You see a brand and you have a feeling or behavior. And this kind of conditioning is generally low involvement in nature. Alternatively, operant conditioning attempts to create an association between a response, like your brand, and some outcome, like satisfaction, that serves to reinforce the response and is generally high involvement in nature. With classical conditioning, imagine the example on your screen. And again, keep in mind, these are under conditions of low involvement. So for example, maybe the condition in this case is a hot summer day. Maybe you've had enough cases of drinking an ice cold Pepsi 
on a hot summer day. So maybe you've done this all of your childhood and you come to college and it's a very hot day and you have this classically conditioned response where you had this thirst specifically for a Pepsi product. You might also remember from your Psych 101 days of Pavlov. Remember Pavlov was the example where every time Pavlov, the scientist, rang a bell, he would serve his dog food. And pretty soon, all he could do, all he would need to do, is ring a bell and the dog would assume he's getting fed. And he had a response to that stimulus, which is the bell. His response was salivation. So he would anticipate receiving a delicious treat. Now you can also have operant conditioning. Again, remember these are under conditions of high involvement. So for a brand, maybe the purchase is some sort of rewarded response. Remember both forms of conditioning is where we as a brand manager or a marketer might want to create some sort of association. And the association is between a response and maybe in a marketing context that response is buying our brand. And then we want that association to have an outcome. In most cases, it's some sort of favorable to the brand outcome, such as satisfaction. So let me pose a question to help you understand the difference here. Some of you may have heard about the Amazon Go stores. The first one opened up in Seattle, Washington. Now let's say in these, in this particular test trial, Amazon is interested in knowing what would be considered the greater reward in consumers' minds. Would it be an instant reward? Maybe you're getting extra loyalty points if you're willing to try this Amazon Go location out. Alternatively, maybe Amazon is considering sales discounts. So which one do you think causes greater rewards for consumers? In other words, you're trying to motivate them to use this new contactless payment. Interestingly, we already know the answer to this question. Results have shown that a sales discount more so than an instant reward is actually more useful in inducing the feeling of a reward in consumers' minds. I'll also use an example that's personal to me. So the example you see on the screen is take hold printing. This is my brother's small business. One thing he did that's very interesting when he was first getting his business started is he realized the value of giving unexpected treats to his new customers. So for example, if he was talking to someone who placed an order with him, as he was making small talk, maybe he discovered what that person's favorite dessert was. So if that person's favorite dessert or Twinkies, he would actually include a box of Twinkies in the box full of shirts to give that unexpected delight to, to his customer. And that's probably not the sole reason why his business is a success today, but it's definitely a very good example of using conditioning to help his customers associate his particular brand with a very favorable outcome. When they place an order, for take hold printing t-shirts, they can expect some sort of delight or aspect of unexpected satisfaction to occur. Here's another example from Pavlok. Pavlok is a brand, it's very famous for the product it sells, but its conditioning isn't in a reward aspect, it's in a punishment aspect. How would you respond to this particular brand's product? More than 40% of our lives are spent in habit. For most of us, that time is wasted. The secret to transformation is not to try harder. It's to replace bad habits with the habits of excellence. If you wanted to transform yourself, how would you start? First, identify the habits that hold you back. Pair them with a negative stimulus like electric shock. Each surge of voltage trains your brain and weakens the neural connection until the bad habit is severed. Next, replace the bad habit with a positive one. Reward yourself when you complete your daily goal. Commit to a penalty if you fail. The fear of loss stimulates your basal ganglia, while the chance of reward motivates your prefrontal cortex. In fewer than 30 days, the action becomes a habit. 
Pavlock is the first system designed to help you build good habits and break bad ones, earn rewards when you succeed, pay the price when you fail, and experience the electric shock that keeps you on track. So how can we use this information about conditioning to get people to change bad behavior? Well, why would marketers care about bad behavior? Well, remember what we covered in chapter one. And personally, I'm a social marketer, so I'm about using marketing to help consumers make better decisions. So maybe that might be to, to stop smoking. So conditioning plays a big role in this particular case. So let me share a very personal example with you, brought to you by the FDA. The FDA had a very big task force full of marketers, psychologists, and a bunch of social scientists, all designed to help teens, specifically, and young college students to stop smoking. So what do you think worked in a variety of ads that were tested with this particular demographic? Well, if we tried to use a guilt tripping appeal, like a warning sign that says, tobacco smoke can harm your children, do you think that was effective with this particular demographic? If your answer is no, you would be correct. What if we take it up a notch? What if we actually show, as gruesome as this may be, someone who has died, presumably, of lung cancer because they smoked their entire life? So a warning sign that said very explicitly that smoking can kill you. Do you think that would be effective with teens and young adults? And if your intuition again suggests no, this kind of appeal probably wasn't effective, you would be right. So what kind of appeal in this case do you think would work? And it brings me great delight to share this outcome with you. And this is known as a vanity appeal. So the ad you see on the screen right now is actually the trigger that worked that increase the number of people in that particular demographic to have the intentions to quit smoking. So an ad in this particular case says, your face will become more saggy, you'll get wrinkles, your breath will stink, your clothes will stink. Anything that appeals to a person's vanity is actually extremely effective with this particular demographic. And again, this is a, an outcome of conditioning. Now let's get into the role of cognitive learning. The cognitive approach to learning includes all the mental acti activities that we as people use as we solve problems or as we cope with complex situations or to function effectively in our environments. So it's a threefold approach. Cognitive learning also includes iconic rote learning which is generally low involvement, vicarious learning or modeling, which can be a mixture of low and or high involvement, and the highest degree, which is analytical reasoning, which is generally high involvement. Again, the mission here is to help you understand that we're using learning here, cognitive learning, mostly to solve problems or to cope, but ultimately to help us function effectively in our environments. At the low end of the scale of involvement is iconic rote learning. It's why the brands you see on the screen right now don't necessarily need to spell out the brand name. For example, you can have the new, relatively new Domino's logo. Does Domino's need to spell out the brand name? Does it need to show a picture of the product it sells? No, we've used by now iconic rote learning to see this icon and understand its association with the brand. Vicarious learning is a form of learning that again may differ between levels of involvement, but we're learning vicariously, usually through observation. So I like to, to use the example on the screen to help you understand how vicarious learning might take place. So for example, imagine you've just gotten your dream job. On the first day of work, you may not know what the appropriate apparel is. Can you show up in something casual? Or is there an expectation for you to wear more business 
attire. Well, you would use, in this case, vicarious learning to see what other people are doing. So you're learning the appropriate response to others' behavior. Next is an analytical reasoning. And this is the most complex form of cognitive learning. And it involves people's engaging in creative thinking, maybe to restructure or recombine existing information, as well as new information to form brand new associations and concepts. Information in these cases from a credible source that may contradict or challenge our existing beliefs will often trigger this specific form of reasoning. So the example I like to give here is what you may have experienced when you first moved to Morgantown. You're learning where the one-way streets are and how to navigate the downtown area. Well, how do you do that? In this example, you have to use the highest form of learning, in this case, analytical reasoning, because your involvement is very high. So you have to figure out and navigate where the one-way streets are. So you can make your way down to bars or restaurants on High Street and then find your way back to your door. So marketers by now know that the strength of learning is enhanced specifically by six different factors. And those factors are importance, the message involvement, mood, reinforcement, repetition, and dual coding. And we use all of this to help us with the very next concept in this chapter known as product positioning. So I'd like to share an example with you from Saucony, the athletic shoe manufacturer. And here, they're trying to use everything associated with memory and how consumers learn to position their product in a very specific way. So watch this ad to see if you can spot the ways that they're, this brand is trying to position their product. Interestingly, this ad is an, was debuted in late August of this year, and it happened to coincide with National Dog Day. And many advertisers typically use animals you know, as props. But here, the animal in this particular ad is very useful in the specific positioning of the Saucony shoe. Take a watch and see what you think. We'll end our discussion of product positioning with using one of my favorite examples. And that's the difference between our perceptions of two big re retailers, Target versus Walmart. Here, the meme for Walmart kind of says it all. It says, because going to Target requires a shower. That's humorous, but of course based in truth, where the perception is, yeah, you can kind of go and shop at Walmart wearing your pajamas. You don't have to care about what you look like. But if you're going to Target, that's a totally different ball game. And it's interesting because of course these are two different retailers who are selling very similar products. In fact, many of the SKUs they sell overlap. In other words, they're selling many of the same items. And in many cases, there are few differences in prices. So again, it's interesting to see how these two retailers differ in positioning. Some of that intentional and some of that is a result of consumer perceptions.